class? Abel and Kayleen? Sharon? Kether? That's all so far. That's plenty. Welcome, folks. Good to have you with us in class. Um, that's, a, that's a good little contingency, all this time all from the same location, Arizona. <laughs> all righty. Um, Contrary to what's written on the board behind us, we are not in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> uh, but we are because that really secretly is the underlying meaning of all that we've been discussing. But <clears throat> uh, we are in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to get into chapter 4. <clears throat> but I'd like to uh, start with just some scriptures and some thoughts uh, first out of 1 Peter. So if you would turn there with me. <clears throat> and um, what we've been discussing in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, the first, the second, and the third chapter, has <clears throat> really been a contrast. <clears throat> it has been a contrast of the, the particular terminology that Paul has used is a contrast of the wisdom of God and the wisdom of this age or the wisdom of words or <clears throat> there's several different ways of putting it. And um, he he make he he starts delving into this a little more in the end of chapter two and chapter beginning of chapter three, which we have covered up to this point. And Paul ends with <clears throat> describing this reality as the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. <clears throat> All right. Um, what that tells me, and, and if you're familiar with Philippians 2, <clears throat> verse 5, he says there, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. And he begins to describe this selfless, self-giving of Christ on the cross for people who are completely unworthy of it and people who deserve death, who deserve torment forever in hell, who deserve, <clears throat> and yet um, he's not telling us in Philippians uh, 2, 5 to celebrate that reality, our salvation as a result of it, but to allow that same mind to be in us. Okay, so back to Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 2, the end there, I think it's the last verse in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, we have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> All right, I'm, I'm making that point for, for this primary reason. <clears throat> when, we, when we have addressed uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and chapter 2, and even over in 3, we've hit this stuff. There was this contrast of this contrast of wisdom. And as we said, one was the wisdom of God, and the other one was the wisdom of this age, or the world. The wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of of this age. All right. So we might assume in the early going, chapter one, where he really brings that home, that all we have to do is just change wisdoms. Just take on the, the, the wisdom of God and therefore, 
that will change our approach. <clears throat> However, chapter 2, he begins to change that description, as I've just said a few minutes ago, from just describing it as a wisdom to the mind of Christ. And Philippians describes that mind of Christ, to be let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, and Jesus, <clears throat> being God, being in the form of God, came to the earth, came as a man, came as something lowly, became lower, became a servant to men, became something lower, became a criminal, as it were, in the eyes of people, and an outcast and a um, demon-possessed person, all these things, you know, he was, he was accused of. And he bore all that on the cross for us. All right. So Paul is saying in Philippians 2, 5, let that mind be in you. Not just some sort of wisdom, not just... Not just an explanation of words. That's the very thing he's saying. Don't go by the wisdom of words. Not an explanation of words or an explanation of a concept. The wisdom of God is this. Be selfless. Be self-sacrificing. All of that. Not just get hold of a wisdom but let the mind of Christ, not the brain of Christ, you know, this isn't Dr. Frankenstein, let the mind of Christ be in you. And with the mind of Christ comes not sacrificial living, but Christ crucified. I mean, I don't know how to describe it any more plainer because it's not sacrificial living. There are monks, there are also, you know, I mean, Buddhist monks, there are all sorts of people that live sacrificially that do not have the mind of Christ. All right? And God wants Christ crucified, not just selfless giving. Now, to keep us on track, you have to use terminology like that. But that's a reality of the word of God and of the scriptures that Paul is trying to make. He's trying to bring us into a completely different view based on a completely different mind. To, to receive, I'm going to say it like this, to receive the mind of the crucified. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, <clears throat> Paul also says over in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18, he's talking to the Colossians and he uses a similar phrase uh, and even some of the wording that he uses a lot in 1 Corinthians. And that is he says something about being puffed up by your fleshly mind. <clears throat> being puffed up by your fleshly mind. All right. <clears throat> Folks, the puffed up that they're being puffed up over there in Colossians is not worldly stuff. It might be the wisdom of this age, but it's not what we would call worldly stuff. It's religious stuff. And the problem that he's having with the Corinthians is not that they're going off into worldly stuff per se, but that they, they're perceptions of things I can't I don't know how else to say it is not the mind of Christ <clears throat> now we think or some people think that the mind of Christ um, is <clears throat> that we change our way of thinking I no longer <clears throat> you know I no longer read pornography or I read the Bible. I know I have learned to pray. I have learned, uh, and so they're contrasting, if, I, if you may, if you'll allow, pornography with the Bible and saying that's the big improvement. Folks, you, cannot, you can be devoid of the mind of Christ and be a full-on Christian 
and think that, you know, learning a lot of doctrines is what God's after, and it's not. God is after not just Christ, but Christ crucified, and particularly, and this is, this is what he's, he declared in 1 Corinthians that we've already covered now in the first three chapters, and in Philippians, and over there in Colossians, he is trying to bring us to the mind of Christ crucified, a mind that, um, well, I had you turn here in 1 Peter, so <clears throat> let's just look here. Um, for, uh, it's verse 21 of chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Okay, a um, couple of things there. Number one, this is talking about a calling that has absolutely nothing to do with a ministry. <laughs> this is a calling unto a... Uh, I'm going to say it a couple of different ways. It's a calling unto a different way of treating everybody. It's a calling unto <clears throat> uh, being separated unto Christ crucified as, a, as, as by his mind, separated unto his way, not just his way of thinking, but his way of proceeding. And so that's why he follows that up with this calling, because Christ also suffered for us. <clears throat> and the significant thing there, and a lot of times these, uh, I, let me just say it like this. I am, by the grace of God, slowly breaking out of something that has been there in my life for 40 years of ministry, and that is the ability to read something like Christ also suffered for us and only seeing atonement in that. Jesus died for us. So somehow we picture the cross 2,000 years ago. But it's not talking about the atonement or the blessings for us. You know what it's talking about? All the time, every time, just about is talking about his selflessness in literally going through suffering for us, the ones who don't deserve it on any level. And that, you know, like, like we talked about last week, how Paul was not just a sinner, he was the greatest persecutor and one who helped you know, kill Christians. And Jesus died for him too. And he saw that it was more than Jesus died for me. Jesus suffered for someone like me that was totally his enemy. And he didn't treat me like an enemy. He met me. And he called me to be his apostle. And he, and you know, like, I mean, I just see Paul's mind blown, as it were, you know, Saul of Tarsus. I just see his mind just like, this is totally, you know, in the law you have to earn everything. And in, in that cross, he saw the definition of the nature of God. And it so dealt with him um, that he, he literally not just embraced the doctrine of Jesus' death for me so I'll be saved. He embraced the crucified way. It's just, just incredible. So, so that for even here unto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, meaning he, and you know, folks, we go, okay, well, he suffered, but you got to think of the magnitude of the suffering. Everything from, from verbal abuse to physical abuse to, to shame and mockery to, um, uh, you know, being considered something that he wasn't to on and on and on. I, folks, every possible thing that you would hate and would rebel against is in that word suffer. Can you, can you, 
Can you embrace that? Can you embrace that this suffering is the stuff that if you were placed into, it would be your worst nightmare instead of the glorious cross. Can I get amen? amen. <clears throat> but Jesus suffered all of that for this over here, us. Okay, remember in the Old Testament, they had this means of redeeming things. And you could use shekels, you could use um, redemption money to redeem certain things. But when it came to redeeming a donkey, some people call it an ass, only a lamb could redeem an ass. That's right, only a lamb could redeem an ass. And we know Jesus is the Lamb of God, and we know that I didn't say it. <laughs> All right. So, here in, um, because here in two we are called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. My Lord, folks, this takes it immediately out of the realm of the atonement. He didn't say he suffered so you'd be saved so you wouldn't go to hell. So he didn't go into the atonement. Do you understand the difference? The atonement meaning something he did to save you, to redeem you from hell, to redeem you, save you from punishment, to all of that. He's not talking about that. He's talking about this one who suffered, this lamb who suffered for a donkey. He left this as an example for you also to follow in his steps. Okay. Now, another thing to, to grab hold of is the steps he's having you follow in is not Jesus of Nazareth. That, there's no mention of Jesus of Nazareth here. There's no mention of the Son of God. There's only the mention of Christ crucified. Can I get amen? amen. You know, you can't you, you, you know, well, I'm going to follow in the way of the healer. God, give me the gift of healing, and I'm going to go. He's not pointing you in that direction. I mean, I'm ready for another amen. amen. He is not pointing you. I mean, whether there are other places he does that or not, I know not. <laughs> but this thing I know, that verse is definitely pointing us to Christ crucified as a way of life, as a way of proceeding, as a way of treating others, okay? And then he begins to describe that so that we don't miss the real meaning in verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And I, I sometime a year ago, I guess, or two, I explained to you that my understanding of that verse was simply <clears throat> Jesus didn't sin. He was sinless. You know, he was, you know, that's one of the attributes of the Son of God that made him <clears throat> uh, um, acceptable as a sacrifice. He was without blemish. Do you are you following what I just said? <clears throat> that was how I read that, that he was, you know, he was without sin. He's the Son of God. He never sinned, and that qualified him to be the Lamb of God, to die in the atonement so that I could be saved. That's, uh, that was m my understanding of this because I didn't see Christ crucified. You know what? I saw me getting saved out of it. Okay? Now, don't misunderstand. I got no problem with you getting saved. I got no problem with the atonement. I always have to back everything up because, I, you know, no matter how much I try to cover all the bases, I can't do it. Something always comes out that can be read another way. But God knows that I try <laughs> to try to, <clears throat> you know, not make stumbling blocks for anyone. But <clears throat> so this scripture and really what we've been discussing in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, and 3 up to this point is primarily 
focusing down not on your salvation, but he's writing to believers to come into Christ crucified as a way of life, as a way of being, to let this mind be in you. That's Paul's words. This happens to be another brother. What's his name? Peter. Peter. Mouth of two or three witnesses, pretty good witnesses there, wouldn't you say? Would, would you say that? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so who did no sin, neither was guile found in, in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Okay, what is it saying then? It is saying Jesus didn't do anything wrong. When it says, who did no sin, it's trying to communicate to you not that he was the sinless son of God that's qualified for the atonement. It's trying to tell you Jesus didn't do anything wrong just like he's described in verse 18, 19, and 20 before this where we read it. And all you got to do is read that real quick and you'll see that that is the subject. His emphasis is strictly on the fact that when Jesus was similar to you in situations where you are being accused of stuff you didn't do, where you are being looked down upon, where you are being considered bad, all this stuff. Well, Jesus didn't do anything wrong either. Do you see what it's saying? I mean, that is what it's saying. Who did no sin, neither was there God, who... Who, when, who, when, who, who, who? The one sin yeah, but specifically Christ crucified, isn't it? Isn't it? The one who is going to the cross and all this. So who, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. Okay. <clears throat> this is what you're called to. This is the wisdom of God before the ages. <laughs> this is the mind of Christ. Okay? Okay? And it goes on. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not. All right. Now, there are different ways of threatening. You do realize that, don't you? Someone can make you suffer, and you can, you can threaten them in a lot of different ways. <clears throat> One way is you can outwardly go, I'm going to kill you. Okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Judas is scared. <clears throat> but, <laughs> um, or... You can just think bad things in your heart and wait, lie in wait like some sort of a beast, waiting for them to trip up or waiting for the right moment to do something, even if they don't know that doing something was connected with, you made me suffer, and this, you know, take that, even though you don't know that's connected with what you did. <laughs> You still take it, sucker. You know, you know there can be a ways beyond what I'm talking about here, but there is this um, reality. And, and let me just say this right here. I've said this over and over. I'm going to say it again. <clears throat> I'm not talking to you. I'm first talking to me, and second of all, Peter's talking to... These, these people, and Paul's talking to those people. If the shoe fits, wear it, but be assured, I, if there ever comes a confrontation between you and me, I'll be the one to lay down my life with no expectation that you should, being reviled, not you have every right to lash back and do whatever you want towards me. Okay? That's settled. Um, I'm not trying to convert anybody to something or to control anything. I'm trying to just communicate the scriptures as I see it from Peter and from Paul. And the most important thing is I've seen something 
that I'm using this as an opportunity for me by saying it to better see it. Now also, what I mean by that is, it's not that I don't believe you don't see Jesus. I, th I know you people. I know you see Jesus. I know you're in the Word. I, I'm not doubting you when I say that. But one of the things that hit me when I first got into 1 Corinthians was this magnitude of the distance between the wisdom of God that was so selfless and self-giving for people who didn't deserve it as opposed to people who are so will do anything to get their way and always put themselves first and always walk on you and be glad that you'll lay down your life because I'll trounce all over you. Not looking at you, but looking at the vastness of the difference between the mind of Christ and the wisdom of this world, I, I'm just, I'm blown away. So, so when I talk like this, I'm, I'm really not seeing you. I'm just seeing this incredible gulf between the two. And I see that there's just almost no hope except God reveal Christ crucified. Because it's not the mind of the Son, it's the mind of Christ crucified. It is here. It is in uh, Philippians 2, clearly. And it is in 1 Corinthians 2, the last verse of that, that chapter. I mean, so, all right. All right, so... Um, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. There, again, another atonement scripture, but this isn't talk, and we take it as an atonement scripture, but it's not talking about the atonement. It's talking about this incredible who his own self, he bore this in his own body on the tree and I, I realize that um, Jesus died for the whole world. Okay. I realize that. He died for everyone's sins. But I think there's a, a really great amount of power that comes when you change that from just an ambiguous, he died for the whole world, or he died for me, because we're not capable of seeing ourselves properly to see that we're some sort of a beast. <laughs> we're not. The best way, and this is just me now, I'm not, I'm not even rec uh, uh, recommending this unless the Lord you know, coaxes you in this direction, but it's been working a lot for me lately. And that is that I'm seeing all of these people, the high priest of God, the, the Pharisees the, you know, for, against Paul or Jesus, um, the, uh, the people that stood up and lied about Jesus and g gave false witness, the Romans that, that smote him. You know? I mean, even in that situation, I was reading the other day, and it says Jesus was standing there, you know, and the Romans were slapping him and mocking him and doing all this stuff. <clears throat> And, you know, you're familiar with the story. It says, and, and they, they put a robe on him and says, prophesy on this, right? You're familiar with that? Well, that's it. See, we, we notice, I noticed that purple robe situation. But basically, before that, it says it stripped him naked and put the robe on him. And you're just standing there. We, we cannot measure the amount of humiliation the Son of God went through for, and, I, and see, when I say us, I look at those guys. You understand what I mean? Because that's us. Do you, do you at least understand what I'm saying here? I look at those guys and go, us. Instead of some ambiguous world, he died for the world and we all needed it. I look at horrible treatment and bad attitudes and maliciousness and coming out at him and just incredible treatment that if you and I, as we said, if you and I went through, it would be just 
devastating. How would we ever recover to that degree? We don't recover to the degree that, and trust me, we haven't gone through anything yet compared to, you know. And so uh, it, it has just helped me to see this in light of actual figures and faces coming against Jesus or coming against Paul, actual situations where I realize, oh my God, the, 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 the shame of this, the humiliation, the, the mockery of this, the, the um, <clears throat> you know, Jesus is hanging on the cross before his mother. I know that, you know, but trust me, if that was you, you know, there's a <clears throat> show comes on every so often, uh, something, uh, something like lock, Locked Up Abroad. And it's about all these people who, you know, somebody talks them into being a drug mule or something, <clears throat> and they end up getting thrown in prison in, you know, Thailand or, <clears throat> or uh, you know, just these horrible places, Nicaragua or all these places, and they're locked up in there <clears throat> and and it's it's their stories of what they went through and how much they had to go through. And the amazing thing that I've noticed on everyone that I've ever watched is when they get to the part about their mother and they say, they start talking about they had to tell their mom or they call their mom or they had to face their mom. Every one of them, I've not found one yet, where they didn't break down and cry and just feel so bad before their mom. And I mean hardened criminals in some cases. Some of them weren't. Some were women, some were men. But some of them hardened criminals. They just, and the worst part, and that's what they always say, the worst part was telling my mom, I keep waiting to see one that, that it's not, you know. And boy, what they did to mom. And so it makes, you know, so instead of that just being a fact, you know, some trivia that's kind of nice, I try to apply that to Jesus hanging on that cross. <clears throat> and you just, there's no way that we can grasp the fullness of this thing. <clears throat> um, who his own self bore all that should have come upon us for all of the filthy, ugly, mean, cruel, hard-hearted actions and thoughts. Um, bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes we're healed. And again... I know I shared this probably at the conference or something, but that by his, whose stripes you are healed there is a continuation of everything here. It's not just a doctrinal atonement fact. I mean, I want you to think about it. Don't, don't go by what I say because, we, because most of you have had a lifetime of believing and being taught that that scripture is an atonement fact that Jesus took these stripes and by that, that's our healing. But the true context the true context is from verse 18 all the way down to here, and it is <clears throat> he took, he subjected himself willingly. He said, no man taketh my life. I, I choose to do this. I choose the way of the cross. I, I choose this. By whose stripes... We. Do you see Christ crucified in there? Do you see that? Do you see that ongoing <clears throat> message? And then, um, <clears throat> and then drop down to verse uh, nine of chapter three. <clears throat> um, not rendering. This is not talking about Jesus now, but us. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this. Okay, and, and that lines up with verse 21 that said, for you, you know, for even here unto were you called. 
that um, we, we know, you know, Jesus said, if someone smites you on one cheek, turn that cheek. Okay. Great theology, great teaching. Let's, let's draw that into the reality of Christ crucified and see it not just as a supreme teaching that is so good, but rather as the result of the formation of the mind of Christ in us. I turn my cheek because hereunto am I called, because I was called to oneness with Christ. I have the ability by oneness to manifest Christ crucified. This has to be my calling. I mean, oneness would make it my calling. Do you, can you see how that, how that is? <clears throat> all right. So, all right, you ready to go? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> now, you got to remember, not everybody in this class has been in every one of them up till now. If you had been, it would be better because you would easily know where I'm going and those who've been here will know that. <clears throat> but for those who don't, <clears throat> I will say this. The actual practical teaching pertaining to Christ crucified is really hard for us, meaning practical for us. The actual making practical of that because <clears throat> the wisdom of God was before the world in relationship to this mind. That's who he was before the world. Who, who was he? Here we go. Self-giving, sacrificial, all of that. <clears throat> we are not that way. We will do things to get our way, whether it's using force or, you know, manipulation or whatever. We will do things to get our way, <clears throat> all right? And because of that, this teaching, trying to talk to somebody about having the mind of Christ can seem like you know, somebody says, well, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Well, this is from like Neptune, okay? It's, it's even, it's further out there, all right? Because it is so selfless, it must surely rub against the grain of everyone, okay? Now, it may not rub against the grain of your spirit. Your spirit may say, oh, that's beautiful, I want that. Just don't talk about it. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> you know, and, and I know from whence I speak because these things work in me. <clears throat> um, so I want to remind you that every time I have to get into the practical areas <clears throat> that you are better off not to sit and try to figure out how to be this. You are better off to just first ask the Holy Spirit to show you this as being true of Christ. And then if you're one with him, you got some hope. But if you don't, you really don't have any hope and it'll either make you mad, give up, you know, faint, you know, something. It'll... It'll cause something, and one way or the other, that'll come out at me. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not trying to self-protect. But nonetheless, there's a, there still is a good chance that I'll end up having to deal with it. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse um, 7. <clears throat> For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And, you know, we're going to read all the way down to like verse uh, 13. For who maketh thee to differ from, from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? 
Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? And if thou hadst not received it, uh, uh, as if thou hast not received it, now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, for ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. <clears throat> all right. Um, What we are seeing here is that Paul has not left his theme of the wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of this age. Okay? He has not left that. He's not going off on another subject. He has moved from chapter 1, 2, and 3. He has moved from dealing with the theology as it were, of the subject of Christ crucified to now the practicality, how it is to be lived out, how it is to, uh, how this wisdom is taken out of the realm of the mystical, how it's taken out of the realm of the, of the historical 2,000 years ago, how we are able to swallow the pill of 1 Peter chapter to where we were just reading or a hundred other places. This, this is where it starts to become practical. And he is talking, folks, to Christians. Okay? He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to heathen. He's not talking to people that are blatantly just doing stuff wrong. He's talking to people with a mindset that wants to take care of self, that wants to not, not, not like robbing people or, you know, like that per se, just me first, you know. Or if I look like I'm helping you, I'm really wanting your approval because you have influence that might da 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 on and on and on. Who can, who could, uh, you know, it's like a web, a mess. It's like a, a, a ball made out of rubber bands and so intertwined, we don't know. We're a mess. We are just a mess. But God's not, and the Lord wants us to enter into this, and that's our hope. And so we. We have to hear these things, but not apply them to us apart from God applying. Hear it, and then say, God, open my heart. If it, and here's, here's the way I pray a lot. Lord, if that's true, that's the way I pray. Lord, if that's true, make it real in me. If it's not, make it a vapor and, you know. So, and that's true of anything. If, if I ever teach anything, Lord, just say, Lord, if that's true, Make it life. Make it real in me. And if it's not, just, you know. I see some of you looking at me like, well, that's why I never can remember any of his teaching. <laughs> All right, quit praying that. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read a little bit from my notes now so I can make sure I get some stuff done here. In chapter 4, Paul shows how those who were called of Jesus to establish the church all live by Christ crucified. Because Paul, when he's talking here, notice he says, ye are and we are. 
He's talking about him and the people that travel with him. Those laborers together. And in their mind, they're laborers together in Christ and him crucified. There's no question about it that that's what's going on here. So Paul is basically trying to show them that, look, everybody that's responsible, you know, talking about Timothy and Titus and, and uh, Ephroditus and, you know, I can't even think of all their names, Demas at the time and, you know, all these guys, all the people who are responsible for building the church, we live according to Christ crucified. Do you see it? How, how he's contrasting us and them. And, and we're, you know. All right. <clears throat> These are the, cho the ones chosen of God as leaders by example. Paul's theology is based on the cross. However, this causes his lifestyle and manner in which he approaches situations, such as this one, to be based on the cross also. In other words, he's told you his theology in chapter 1. He's really spread it out in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he started doing a little bit of applying. But chapter 4 now, he's using him and these other men of God that God chose as an example. And he, he used Christ as the original example, didn't he? But he's showing now in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Christ. And yet it's still Christ, but it's Christ in us, and we live according to this also. All right, so the Corinthians had a glory other than that which Paul and his team had. And you find that in verse 7. Um, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? <clears throat> in verse 7, the Corinthians, gl Corinthians' glory was to boast in something as though their own glory and specialness earned it for them, while all along it came through, it came through Christ crucified. That's where it came from. They didn't get a ounce of it on their own merit. That's the law. It's all a free gift. But it's but see, we 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 have the theology of the free gift. We go, oh, it's all a free gift. Well, it wasn't a free gift for him. It was torture and mis, you know, uh, mistreatment and abuse and, and all this kind of stuff. It was Christ crucified. It was those stripes. It was everything that he went through that they got it. But they've, they've gotten past Christ crucified now. And now they've become something. Paul is dealing with this wisdom of this age again in this chapter. He's, he hadn't stopped yet because he's still seeing it as an issue. <clears throat> all right. And um, their, um, their glory was also found in being rich and reigning. That's verse 8. Uh, now you are full. You are rich. You have reigned as kings without us. <laughs> um, Paul, Paul, oh, Paul's group was that they were functioning in conformity Oh, okay, Paul's glory was that they were functioning in conformity to Christ crucified, right? Everything he said, but we, he's, he's functioning and they're functioning according to Christ crucified. He calls it being assigned to death. Do you see it in, uh, what is it, uh, verse 9, for I think that God has set us forth. God set us forth. He's assigned us to this. Um, these babes in Christ also gloried in being wise in Christ, but they of Paul's group were fools for Christ's sake. All right. What does it mean to be a fool for Christ's sake? Well, it means to be functioning by the wisdom that seems foolish. We've already dealt with that in the first chapter and in the second chapter. To be a fool for Christ, folks, is to be reckoned that based on this wisdom of God. Did I say go? Look at this. Go to God. <laughs> I'm not ready to call on you, but I am Gauging how much time until your hand gets so tired you don't hold it up anymore. Okay. Um, 
So uh, what I said is these babes in Christ also gloried in, in being wise in Christ, but they of Paul's group were fools for Christ's sake because and only because the we dealt with this in the first chapter, the wisdom of God is foolishness to them. The wisdom of the cross is absolute foolishness. It doesn't make sense that, you know, again, talking about something that I shared last week, you know, that the Pharisees and the high priests and everybody, they killed Jesus. The thing had been going for three and a half years. They were tired of it. People were starting to say he was this and that and honoring him and not honoring them. And so he... he um, so they finally put him to death. And then the next thing they hear is all these rumors going around and this excitement and this sparks going off. And they're talking about these followers of Jesus are talking about and spreading this incredible, incredulous story that this criminal, God, raised him up and made him the Messiah. <laughs> Just go, oh my God, what in the world? This is crazy. He's dead. God, God didn't come down here and die on a cross. We didn't kill God. That was a criminal. That was a, a deceiver. We are fools for Christ's sake is what, what he's talking about there. Because they said, for the wisdom of God is foolishness to them. And he calls it the foolishness, then, then Paul says, the foolishness of God, meaning the cross. The foolishness, what they deem the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Talking about the cross. Okay, that's what he was sharing in the first chapter. Guess what? That's what he's living right now. Can you see that? Um, well, let me make sure I've covered this here. Uh, so in verse 10, we begin to see the application of the wisdom of God and its contrast to the wisdom of this age. Um, seven minutes back there. Okay, let's go, let's go to the first chapter again. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look beginning with verse 26, so that we can be reminded of this. <clears throat> Let's start with 25, <clears throat> and I just quoted it. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, but because the foolishness of God, meaning the cross, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for you see your calling. Why does he keep saying this is our calling? Doggone it, first it's Peter, now Paul. My calling is to become someone great in the kingdom of God. My calling is to, you know, to greatness. Well, that's some people's view, but it wasn't Peter's view, and it wasn't Paul's view, and you're running out of apostles there, you know. <laughs> All right, so... For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen what? The foolish. the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Okay, let's go now. Let's go back to uh, chapter 4. And see if we don't pick up some of the very same things that he's talking about there in this. Um, let's try verse 10. We are fools for Christ, but ye are wise. Is that not the same exact contrast that he's been making all along of those who think they're wise in this world and those wise people say that we're foolish for preaching not just Jesus, but Christ crucified, because that's what Paul's emphasizing. Okay? So there's, there you have that. Um, 
um, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Despised did not even use that word when we read it over there in verse 28, I think it was, and despised to bring to naught. Um, so <clears throat> what he's doing is, again, he's not jumping all over the place like most people who, the way they seem to try to comprehend the scripture. He's staying right on a line, going right through, and now he's applying the things that were true of Christ crucified and the things that were true of the, the Corinthians when God <coughs> saved them. <clears throat> he's applying that same principle to them. It's still Christ crucified. There's Christ in them. It's still, the, it's still the one, but it's Christ in them. <clears throat> All right, so um, they were strong, but Paul's followers suffered much and were weak. They had glory, but Paul and those who labored with him had reproach, rejection, and were despised. <clears throat> It is, uh, it is important to realize, I'm getting four minutes here, so it's, I'm going to just read this one paragraph and then we'll stop. <clears throat> it is important to realize that Paul has not left this theme of the wisdom and power of God being Christ crucified. These verses have, have left the doctrinal presentation of it and are now displaying how the hidden wisdom is to be applied to daily life. It is also helpful to remember that this way of approach because it is based on the wisdom of God before the ages, appears as completely foolish to most. Okay, now you could see that in relationship to Christ crucified, couldn't you, at the cross? Couldn't you see how they would go, that God came down here and the way he changes everything and the way he saves everybody and, and does this marvelous salvation is God lets people just nail him up on a cross and call him a criminal and call him a you know reprobate. You can see how foolish that would look. It looks just as foolish. I think I wrote it right here. It looks just as foolish when the apostle is saying, well, I'm God's man sent to you, and he's looking the same way, weak and, and foolish. And <clears throat> All right, so um, every bit as foolish as was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and the, and the person of God being crucified as a rejected, despised, powerless criminal, even so is the ridiculousness of an apostle who claims his calling to be a constant death sentence. <clears throat> In the first place, this Christ crucified approach by Paul may have been the thing that caused some of the church of Corinth to look away from him as their apostle because they were looking for someone of noble stature with influence, authority, and the standing that would elicit the enlistment of others of Corinth to join this new movement. And then I wrote Paul, and then in parenthesis because his name means small, Paul, small, did not fit the bill. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back shortly. <clears throat> 